Hello everyone, David Drapkin here, letting you know about a scheduling change for the second cohort of our eight-week live-taught online course, Psychedelic Neuroscience Demystified, How Psychedelics Alter Consciousness and Produce Therapeutic Effects. The course is now starting on November the 1st, so you've got more time to enroll. You can go to psychedeliceducationcenter.com for all the details, but in a brain-shaped nutshell, here are the basics. So once again, the course is being taught by Dr. Melanie Pincus and Dr. Manish Gurm, and they've designed this course with a combination of live group classes and in-depth masterclass video lectures, making it accessible to both scientists and non-scientists by focusing on the real-world practical applications of cutting-edge research and therapeutic models. Throughout the course, you'll have the opportunity to connect with like-minded individuals from around the world and engage in meaningful discussions about this exciting emerging field. So, Whether you're a mental health professional, researcher, or simply interested in expanding your personal and professional knowledge, this course is designed for anyone looking to have a deeper understanding of the neuroscience underlying psychedelic therapy. Classes start again, November the 1st, and you can find out more information and enroll on psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Join us on a journey into the brain on psychedelics. Psychedelics Today is excited to announce we are the premier partner of the Remind Psychedelics Business Forum, a two-day conference and networking event happening November 28th and 29th at the Westgate Las Vegas Resort and Casino in partnership with MJ BizCon. The forum brings together entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, policymakers, and healthcare professionals at the forefront of this rapidly evolving industry. Psychedelics Today founder Joe Moore will be presenting alongside an incredible lineup of speakers such as Courtney Barnes, Ariel Clark, Amanda Ryman, Josh Hardman, and many more. Registration includes breakfast, lunch, coffee break, and a networking reception. And I heard such great things about Remind last year that I'm making sure to personally be there, so I hope to see you in Vegas. Visit remindmedia.com and you can use code REM, R-E-M, psych, P-S-Y-C today for 10% off your registration. Shalom, everyone. It's David Drapkin here, letting you know that the team at Psychedelic Today have launched a brand new course. It's called Navigating Psychedelics, Jewish Informed Perspectives on Psychedelics. The course merges together the best of our Navigating Psychedelics Masterclass interviews with a brand new curriculum and new teaching team focusing on the cultural, phenomenological, mystical, and spiritual aspects of Jewish psychedelic use. Over the course of nine weeks, our group of students will meet live every Tuesday alongside myself and the guest instructor of the week. Instructors include Dr. Ido Cohen, Madison Margolin, Rabbi Zach Kamenet, and Natalie Ginsberg. Students will also join a private online community to continue the learning and networking after completing the course. You don't need to be Jewish to enroll in this course, by the way, folks. It's open to both clinicians and wellness practitioners seeking advanced cultural competence, as well as non-practitioners that are interested in the intersectionality of psychedelic consciousness with Jewish spirituality and contemporary cultural and psychological experiential Jewish realities. To find out more and to enroll, please visit psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Hi everybody, here we are. Today we have a legend, <laughs> Ethan Nadelman. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Joe. It's great to be on your show. Yeah, it's been a while and I'm excited we uh, persevered, so thank you. And um, for those who don't know you, you've really, I think, primarily um, known for your work at Drug Policy Alliance. Were you a founder at Drug Policy Alliance? Yeah. No, I mean, I first came to prominence on this issue really in the late 1980s when I was teaching at Princeton University. And it was the late 80s and the drug war was at this hysterical peak. And I, uh, you know, I published a number of articles that all of a sudden catapulted me into a few bouts of 15 minutes of fame, just challenging the whole drug war. And then in uh, 94, uh, I'd gotten a call from George Soros, the then not not so famous philanthropist back in 92, but already wealthy. And as a result of that, I left the university, started what was initially called the Lindesmith Center, which was a drug policy institute that was part of Soros's new Open Society Institute. And then in 2000, so 23 years ago, I spun my institute out of Soros's foundation 
Foundation, merged it with another organization, the Drug Policy Foundation, that had really launched things but fallen on hard times. And that was the formal creation of the Drug Policy Alliance. So, you know, I, yeah, I, I essentially founded it, although it effectively was the merger of two organizations. Oh, I love that. And, and what were you doing at Princeton? Well, I I was teaching. I was assistant professor of uh, public affairs and uh, public policy in the Woodrow Wilson School and the politics department at Princeton. I was teaching undergraduate courses on law and society, law and public policy. And then I was teaching drug policy seminars. In fact, that was the way I first met some of the leading figures involved in this issue wow. back in the day. With this is we're now talking 35 years ago. It's incredible. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's great. And like, what was the, were you receiving any crazy pushback at Princeton or were you given some <laughs> leniency? You, you know, Joe, it's funny you ask. I, it, on the one hand, it wasn't so much about the substance of what I was saying, because my, my message then, I, I mean, I was now, I got identified as the leading drug legalizer. Um, but in fact, I was never a libertarian. So my views were much, much more that we need to understand that most of what we are identifying as part and parcel of the drug problem were in fact the results of a failed prohibitionist policy. And then we had a lot to learn from the analogies to the American experience with alcohol prohibition back in the 20s and early 30s. But that did not necessarily mean that outright repeal of all drug prohibition and legalization was the right way to go. So it was always a more nuanced perspective that rapidly began to include the harm reduction thinking that was emerging out of Europe in the mid and late 1980s. Um, but at the university, um, not, you know, in, in my department, in the politics department, they tended to say, Ethan, don't think you're going to get any credit towards tenure for all your becoming a public figure on the drug policy issue. All we're interested in is your contribution to the discipline of political science, which I really didn't get much of a damn about. I mean, I just thought that was kind of esoteric. And, you know, I, I played the game, but it wasn't where my passion was. Interestingly, though, Joe, the university you know, the senior university people seem kind of positive. And in fact, I even had people asking me if I'd be willing to go out on the road and speak to alumni groups. So, you know, that was, uh, you know, Princeton was not really shying away. I think the other thing that happened was here I am a 31 year old assistant professor at Princeton. And all of a sudden, you know, limos are showing up every week to take me to appear on nationally televised programs or to fly off someplace around the U.S., around the world to give some well-paid speech about the evils of the drug war. And I think and then, you know, I had hundreds of students lining up down the hall to sign up for my classes. And I think that generated a little bit of a resentment and, you know, not good feeling with some of my colleagues. But mostly they were pretty, <laughs> mostly they were pretty generous about it you know yeah you know you got to pick the right department <laughs> yeah no it's true and you know the truth is i was out there going to the academic conferences and speaking about this and related issues and you know at american society of criminology and the sociology the political science the law and society conferences and then even at one point the very prestigious american academy of arts and sciences um at stanford you know invited me to be one of their keynote lecturers and that was early on when most people were being invited were much older than me and already nobel prize winners or very distinguished academics so it, mm -hmm. it, it it was part of what helped you was I pub, where I it wasn't just the Princeton or Primateur that really helped me. It was two other things. One was that um, my research leading up to that had been on the internationalization of the drug war. So in graduate school, I would actually gone and gone in a security clearance. I'd worked in the State Department's Narcotics Bureau, report, you know, writing a classified report on efforts to deal with drug related money laundering. And I traveled to 19 countries all around South America, Europe, interviewing DEA and FBI and Customs and CIA and foreign drug enforcement agents. And I was published stuff where I leaned over backwards to be respectful of what all the law enforcement types were doing. You know, I, I wasn't my commentary that the whole thing was absurd and a lot like alcohol prohibition. But nonetheless, I took seriously the enterprise that they were engaged in, which was the challenges of enforcing criminal laws and going after, you know, criminals when those activities were transnational in scope. So that gave me some real credibility, including with the law enforcement types, because the book that I wrote out of that work called Cops Across Borders was became assigned reading in the DEA training courses. Wow. And so I was seen as kind of 
you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, the world's leading academic on the internationalization of criminal law enforcement, even as I was arguing that this whole drug war was totally crazy and we needed to think about legalizing. And then the second thing that helped me is that I published my articles in very prestigious places. So Foreign Policy Magazine was one of the two most famous and still is, you know, leading international relations publications. The Public Interest no longer exists, but it was the leading kind of right of center public policy journal. And then in 89, a year later, I published a major piece in science and science was really hitting the pinnacle. So that gave me a level of credibility. You know, I mean, I subsequently published quite a bit of stuff in Rolling Stone, but I was not publishing in Rolling Stone then. I was publishing in foreign policy, public interest in science. It's very strategic. Ah, yeah. Yeah, it was. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I'd be remiss. Like, how did how did George Soros? find out about you has he been interested in this kind of liberalized uh, drug policy thing for a while no he hadn't um i mean his focus remember his focus in the 80s as he became wealthy and early 90s was really he was the leading private philanthropist um, trying to bring about the downfall of socialist dictatorship in the former soviet union and in soviet union eastern europe and then when it all crumbled you know between 89 and 92 or whatever much faster than anybody even including him, expected, he started asking himself the question, you know, that he'd always assumed that the model of the open society was the United States. And in what cases was the United States not actually, you know, consistent with open society ideals? And the first thing that hit him between the eyes was the war on drugs. I think it, right. it, I think it just kind of hit him, first of all, because as a businessman thinking about global markets, he just understood that trying to prohibit commodities for which there was vast, you know, markets like marijuana, cocaine, mm -hmm. you know, just made no sense. Part of it, I think, hit him a bit on the human rights side of things and the irrationality of it. Part of it, I think, was the whole kind of demonization of science and all the kind of drug war rhetoric and all this sort of stuff. And so I think he just asked an aide for... Um, uh, you know, who was the most prominent person out there, uh, you know, expert on this stuff. And I would be the first name that would pop up. I mean, you had people like Milton Friedman and William Buckley, the famous conservatives who were already out there on the issue. And you had people like Ira Glasser, the head of the Civil Liberties Union, who would speak out occasionally. Um, but I was really the leading kind of intellectual academic on this. Um, and then I should say, if you ask Soros, there was a second thing that happened was that first article I published in the spring of 1988 um, uh, called U.S. Drug Policy, Bad Export. By pure coincidence, the article right either before or after mine was one on the stock market crash of 87. It Black, was called Black Monday by a guy named George Soros. So there was this kind of karmic coincidence of our having written these back-to-back -back articles back there in 1988. So George had probably seen that article back in 88, although he did not reach out until the summer of 92. And when he reached out in the summer of 92, I still remember. It was a day in the 90s. I was going to meet this, you know, financier, but it was incredibly hot, like, like New York is these days. And I just wore a little polo shirt and uh, went in there and we spent two hours in his office over lunch arguing and, you know, arguing with our mouths open and eating and all this sort of stuff. And at the end of it, he says to me, he goes, look, you know, I see we agree on the basic issues. I mean, we have our differences, but we basically on the core. So I'm a very busy man, but I have substantial resources. So let's assume I want to empower you to accomplish our common objectives. And I kind of laughed and went back home, sent him a proposal. And a year later, in 93, we shook hands. And in 94, I left Princeton and, uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and it was, you know, and, and started up my institute first in this foundation. But it was fortuitous. I mean, George really came at this from an international perspective. And it, well, it involved the kind of, you know, as I said, you know, his, his human rights side, his opposition to socialist dictatorship type of thinking, the rhetoric, the demonization, the use of kind of totalitarian like tactics um, and that market side of his brain just going, this stuff makes no sense. Right. Right. It's it's uh, it's clear. Um, yeah. So uh, I hope my audience understands why the drug war is not great. Um, I would hate to spend your time substantially here but 
in do you have like a brief thing you like to say about why the drug war has has been a failure or is not a good thing for us in society? Well, Joe, one thing I've come to realize is that many younger people are barely familiar with the phrase drug war anymore. I mean, back in the Yikes. 80s, you know, it was Nixon launched the drug war in the 70s and then it kind of faded a bit in the late 70s, you know, mid 70s, late 70s under Gerald Ford and uh, Jimmy Carter. But then it kind of launched right back even before Ronald Reagan came into power in 1981. And it was really all of the hysteria around various substances, notably marijuana mm. and cocaine, and then the crack cocaine thing was emerging and really causing legitimate concerns. Um, but what the result of it was, was um, that the United States, law, you know, until the early 70s, our rate of incarceration was more or less at the global average. But between 1980 and 2000, we increased the number of people behind bars from 500,000 to over 2 million people, right? We increased the number of people being incarcerated for drug law violations from 50,000 to 500,000, a tenfold increase. And that doesn't uh. account the many, many other hundreds of thousands of others who are being locked up and incarcerated, you know, for parole violations related to drugs, for getting involved in violent disputes over drug markets, for stealing, uh, you know, stealing something to support a drug habit. So you were talking about the war on drugs was the number one thing driving mass incarceration in America from the 1980s until the aughts. So for about 20 odd years, it was the forefront, the cutting edge of mass incarceration. And remember, you get to the early 2000s, the United States has the highest rate of incarceration in the world, right? Not just the highest number, right? More, you know, China has five times our population, but we got far more people incarcerated. We're the highest per capita. I mean, the Russians are in second place, huffing and puffing to keep up and we're leaving them in the dust. Right. So massive incarceration, overwhelmingly of black and brown people, you know, who are disproportionately being targeted and arrested for all sorts of sometimes understandable, but oftentimes totally illegitimate reasons. Right. So that was one major component. The second major component was the refusal to treat drug use and addiction as a health issue rather than a criminal issue. So we were locking up people for drug addictions, even if they were not going out and hurting anybody else. Right. We were saying we're not going to try to stop the spread of AIDS by providing and clean needles because that might encourage more drug use. You know, we were not doing anything to prevent overdose fatalities. We were not providing honest drug education to young people. It was all this kind of ideological abstinence only, you know, model All even drug treatment. Methadone, which is an effective approach for people who have been addicted to street heroin. Methadone was being stigmatized and demonized. You basically had, you know, you know, abstinence only drug treatment as the only option, a 12 step model, which is, you know, fine in its own world. But when you marry a 12 step model of drug treatment to a criminal justice system, you're talking about a really pernicious and ineffective way of dealing with drug addiction. So you had all of that. And then the international side, which was most of these drugs were coming from outside the US. This was a global commodities market. There was no way to keep this stuff from coming in the country. But meanwhile, we're putting Colombia and Mexico and Bolivia and, and the Caribbean countries and some of the Asian countries, ultimately Africa, you know, we're putting them as between a rock and a hard place where basically they're being forced to try to crack down, but have no capacity to crack down on a global commodities market like that. So you have gangsters, violent gangsters becoming increasingly politically powerful and sometimes taking over entire cities or regions or even countries abroad. So you had this whole global dimension that was going on. And then, of course, the idiotic rhetoric and the anti-science and, you know, the Nancy Reagan just say no bullshit. And, you know, and then, you know, actually, you know, I mean, even the Democrats were kind of jumping on the drug war, not quite as ferociously as the, as the Republicans, but still going along with the whole thing and sometimes playing terrible roles as well. So the drug war resulted in the unnecessary arrests of tens of millions of Americans, the unnecessary incarceration of millions of Americans, oftentimes for very long periods of time, hundreds of thousands of people dying in this country of HIV AIDS unnecessarily, tens of thousands dying of overdose unnecessarily. I mean, that was the drug war, you know, and We've had some success, you know, in rolling that back, especially with marijuana and now with psychedelics. We, you know, we've gotten rid of a lot of mandatory minimum drug sentences with other drugs. Still a long way to go, but we can talk in more detail about all that if you like. <laughs> so the next step I like to jump into or I've been curious about is this. Um, what's your perspective on the United States exporting its war on drugs? It sounds like you did some writing on that in the early days, but like, was there any kind of twisting of arms at the UN to make this go down or 
How did well, it I go mean, from Nixon's project to global? I mean, even before Nixon, Joe, because the U.S. government was really, really the leading uh, proselytizer and promoter and enforcer of a global you know, highly punitive prohibitionist model toward drugs from early in the 20th century until roughly the second term of Obama, where then there's a significant change that all kind of happens following the legalization of marijuana in Colorado and Washington and forcing the Obama administration to kind of rethink how it's approaching drug policy. Plus, and also the fact that he'd been elected for a second time, it gave him some latitude to do what I think he really wanted to do in the first place, but did not risk doing in his first turn. Um, so the U.S. is applying enormous pressure bilaterally, multilaterally, first through the League of Nations before, you know, World War II, then through the United Nations, you know, lots of bilateral pressure, whether it was on Mexico or for that matter, it could have been Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, if people were deviating from the U.S. model. Um, the first, the major figure from the 30s to the early 60s was Harry Anslinger, who was the founder, the, for, the first head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics from 1930 to 1962, but whose job before he took that job in 1930, had been being head of the foreign control section of the U.S. Alcohol Prohibition Bureau. So he had come from international background, very much saw the U.S. playing this global role. And of course, we had the DEA becoming essentially the first international police agency, um, you know, opening up offices in 40, 50, 60 countries, hundreds of agents around the world, you know, teaching other countries the U.S. model of doing things. So we really did that in a very aggressive way. But the one misconception I've always been keen to address, and actually, you know, I, I did a TED Talk back in 2014. I did it out in Rio uh, de Janeiro. And one of the points I made there was that, you know, people, especially in South America, a place like Mexico or Latin America, Mexico, Colombia, whatever, they oftentimes assume that the war on drugs for the U.S., like our export of the war on drugs, they assumed it wasn't really about drugs, that it was really about a subterfuge so that the U.S. could advance, you know, ulterior economic, political, security, and military objectives. And my response to that was to say, basically, that's wrong, right? That, in fact, the United States you know, that the inter exporting our drug war, in fact, undermines international interests, right? It undermines, we, we have, we don't have an interest in, you know, guerrillas and narcos and everybody fighting it out in Colombia and blowing up pipelines. We don't have an interest in spending big parts of our military on this drug stuff. We don't, we don't have an interest in doing that, right? Essentially the American interest, we'd essentially like all of the countries to be like Canada, right? Democratic, free trade, no threat to the U.S. I mean, that's that would be the perfect U.S. world in a way, right? And the U.S. war on drugs was undermining that. And so that it was therefore important to understand the internationalization of the U.S. drug war as an international projection of a domestic psychosis. We really were and sometimes are crazy about drugs. And just as the U.S. was one of the only countries in the Western world to prohibit alcohol back in the 20s, so our hysteria about drugs was something more deeply rooted in our national psyche. And it was something that effectively was undermining America's interest in a healthier society, both domestically and internationally. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. I I, th I think that's really one of the better ways to put it. I I always tried to conspiracy it out and figure out what yeah. those interests were, but I could never figure it out other than you know, perhaps incarceration and well, perhaps I mean, enhanced Joe, militarization externally. If you like think about Columbia. once you have an internationally mm -hmm. punitive militarized policy, then there are bureaucracies which try to figure out how do, how do we make this work for us? So initially, for example, the Pentagon did not want to get into international drug enforcement. Once Congress basically dictates that and gives them no choice, then they say, well, how can we make this work for us? Maybe going after you know drug dealers can help us get make us better, give us practice for going after other types types of, you know, guerrillas or other types of, you know, smugglers or stuff like that, right? Or if we're already going after the drug, you know, drug wars, well, where, where else can this help us in terms of some of the political games we're playing? Where, if there's some politician we don't like, can we take them out 
because they're involved with drug dealing, right? The Noriega thing, right? Noriega, the dictator in Panama, who the U.S., you know, launched an invasion of Panama and got rid of him. And they justified it, you know, because Noriega was, in fact, deeply involved with drug smuggling. But you had so you had you had ways where when you already have a global drug war, you can find ways to make it that can legitimize the conspiracy theory. But deep down in the basic structural level, I mean, essentially, this was undermining our interests left, right and center. You know, we would have had we would have a huge interest in in Mexico and Colombia and Peru and other countries not being so overwhelmed by increasingly powerful narco traffickers and, you know, transnational criminal organizations. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Do you have any disagreement with the famous Milton Friedman line? Like if we wanted to have this situation today of you know, really crazy global drug trafficking, like we couldn't have promised for a better or couldn't have hoped for a better kind of um, legal framework around drugs. Well, you know, it's funny. Cause I, I, I got to know Milton Friedman um, because we were allied wow. on this issue and, and back in late 80s, early 90s. And in fact, when I published that article in Science in the fall of 89, Milton saw the article and gave it to George Shultz, the former Republican secretary of everything, you know, Treasury and OMB and, you know, budget and and secretary of state, who was just down the hall from him at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And then and then George Shultz read the piece and then gave a speech where he pointed people to my article. And then as a result of that, I developed a relationship with George Shultz, who became a a really significant ally on this stuff. And to have one of the most distinguished Republicans in the country where Milton Friedman and I disagree. We essentially agreed on the critique of drug prohibition, the drug war. In fact, I'll tell you, there was a remarkable moment at the first when Soros finally, after he created Open Society Institute, he then slowly created a board. And then in um, early, uh, late 96, we had just won the first medical marijuana initiative in California, as well as a treatment instead of incarceration one in Arizona. And there'd been a lot of media attention on this. And everybody was saying Soros and I were all about just legalizing all drugs and giving drugs to kids. And, you know, whether it was Senator, Senator Hatch in the uh, Senate, U.S. Senate, or whether it was very powerful New York Times uh, uh, op-ed columnist A.M. Rosenthal, they were all making these wild accusations. And so I went to see Soros and he asked me, what's our next move? And I say, George, you know, I think our next move is I want you to make a very public $1 million commitment to fund needle exchange programs in the U.S. to reduce AIDS. And he said, why? I said, because everybody thinks this is about legalization, you know, legalizing all drugs, but you and I know this is fundamentally about harm reduction and science-based drug policy. And it'll send a message to everybody that we're not just about marijuana, we're about science-based, compassionate, public health-driven drug policy. And George said, yes. And so then I had to present to his board, and he had just created a board, and this was 19, you know, it was like nine white Ben and Lonnie Guineer, a very prominent African-American law professor at Harvard. And I remember I go there and Lonnie is the one person who's a little resistant to the needle exchange thing at, at first. Right. And 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 she's kind of, you know, part of it was the you know more black establishment was still wary of needle exchange harm reduction back in that day. But eventually I persuade her. And one thing she says to me is, Ethan, I think you should take that op-ed piece that Milton Friedman just published in the Times or the Wall Street Journal or something, and you should send it to every prominent black leader in America. So there's Lonnie Kinnear, a lefty Harvard law professor, suggesting that I send Milton Friedman's op-ed piece to, you know, every prominent black leader in America. And the reason being that Milton had made a very powerful, you know, not just logical economic space, but also a very powerful moral argument against drug prohibition. So we agreed fundamentally on that part. Where we disagreed is in what should come in its place. You know, and he was basically a free market libertarian. And his view was that the government should not be involved even in regulating this very much, except to keep it out of the hands of kids. And my view was we needed, as with alcohol and tobacco, you know, very you know, sensible public health measures, higher level taxations, restrictions on time and place, the things that you would normally do to try to advance public health objectives. But I'll never forget, there was a moment where I said, well, Milton, I mean, I mean, we don't you think we need a regulatory agency, something that um, can ensure that consumers, you know, are actually getting the drugs that they want to get, you know, proper labeling, proper marketing. And he said, Ethan, what do you need FDA for that? Why can't it just be something like Consumer Reports? 
And I didn't really have a great answer for him. Like maybe a private agency could play that role as well as a public agency. You know, I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of how well the FDA has handled a lot of these issues. So, so we dis. I mean, that was typically the, the ring, you know, uh, the people coming from the left of center, like myself, agreed fundamentally with the right of center libertarians on the critique of drug prohibition, the drug war, where we disagreed was on how far you should take legalization or decriminalization and how much of a, a role the government should play in trying to advance public health once you decriminalize uh, these drugs. Right. That's interesting. So I, <laughs> I had exposure. There's a recent, um, uh, psychedelic conference for lack of a better word in denver somewhat recently put on by this group called students for liberty which has some backing from cato institute and i was asked to speak and that was my first exposure to libertarians in person you know i'm from new hampshire so it's kind of in our blood a little but uh -huh. like i don't it blows my mind when people go that far it's fascinating but anyway like i learned a lot there about like alternate perspective and well, well, like non-state run Thanks. I, I'll tell you the other thing I'll tell you about that is with the students for the, I think it was students for liberty, but the younger libertarian groups, you know, I because I spoke to some of those groups and sometimes, you know, I would I'd speak at their conferences or this or that. And there's also an international version of students for liberty. And and at one point there was some poll. This must have been 10, 15 years ago, querying libertarians um, about what issues they most cared about. And for the older generation, it was oftentimes taxes and overregulation. For the younger generation of libertarians, it was disproportionately the drug war and issues where they somewhat overlapped with, you know, left-wing civil libertarians on personal liberty issues. There was, you know, I befriended um, Grover Norquist, you know, the kind of famous right-wing guy, head of Americans for Tax Reform. The guy whose mm -hmm. famous line was, I want to make government so small you can strangle it in a bathtub. He was the one who, who you know, started <laughs> oh that gosh. pledge, the, the no new taxes pledge that the vast majority of Republicans elected to Congress felt obliged to sign on to. But very smart guy, very smart and provocative. And I had gone to see him. He was initially leery because of my connection with Soros and knowing where I was coming from politically. But, but we connected. And one result was that he arranged for me to speak or debate at the annual CPAC conference you know, the leading wow. right wing gathering in America. Now, you know, back then it, there was no Trump. So it was right wing without there being Trumpism and neo fascism permeating the entire party. Um, but I tell you, I went there and I'd be up on stage debating somebody and there'd be people in the audience shouting out, oh, don't listen to him. He works for Soros. Da, da, da. And meanwhile, at the end of the debate, I'd win the majority of the applause. And it was the younger people showing up at that conference who were passionate about ending the drug war for many of the same reasons that the left-wing uh, kids were passionate about ending the drug war. And in fact, to some extent, one other positive thing about this was that, was that young people whose politics leaned to the left, and like in, in Drug Policy Alliance, you know, my politics were left of center. Most of my staff was even further left of center. I'll always had a couple of libertarians as well. Um, but one of the things that, that the drug war did was a lot of people on the left think government's the answer to a lot of things, right? And they can be kind of indiscriminate in thinking that way. But when you focus on the evils of the drug war, which is overwhelmingly something being done by government, not by private parties, it makes left-wing youth very aware that government can really fuck things up in a serious way and be wary of where you think government's going to be the answer. And so that kind of healthy skepticism um, about that really, really, you know, it was really valuable. The other thing, Joe, about the libertarians is that there was a growing number of the libertarian writers. I'm thinking most especially of Jacob Sullum, who's been covering the drug issue at Reason Magazine, Libertarian Magazine, since the 1980s. And it's just been a brilliant writer about drugs and drug policy, written books, articles. Or, or there was another guy who was um, uh, Alan, uh, I'm spacing his name right now, but he was the op-ed, uh, uh, Alan Bach, I think, the op ed columnist for the Orange County Register, you know, in Orange County, California, also a libertarian guy. But what you found with these guys was that they were perfectly willing to get into the nuances. You know, the early libertarians was, you know, give us legalization. We're not interested in regulation, not interested in harm reduction. You know, I mean, you know, but the but the more sophisticated libertarians and this ultimately became true of the folks at Cato Institute as well, um, you know, really were will be willing to say, you know what? Hey, listen, we accept what the liberals are saying. 
which is that we may not like regulation, but regulation is a lot better than pro than prohibitionist laws, you know. And that that nuance also helped advance the kind of cross ideological conversation among people who, uh, you know, disagreed with the drug war and the prohibitionist approach. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, the the arguments were compelling at times, and I'm like, I don't have really good pushback, guys. Yeah, I know I certainly want some regulation because I know people get a little crazy here and there, but I don't know about in the drug landscape. It's fascinating. I wonder. Yeah, well, I yeah, wonder what the way forward is. I mean, Joe, I'll tell you, it was a really interesting moment in late 1999. Uh, the state of New Mexico, which was largely Democratic, but they had a Republican governor, Gary Johnson, who was very libertarian minded and who in later years actually became the Libertarian Party candidate for president in uh, the elections like, I don't know, six years, 10 years ago, whatever. But La Gary Johnson was overheard in a restaurant in late 99 where he was having lunch with the guy who was both the state chair of the um, of the of New Mexico Republican Party, John Dendall, mm -hmm. and another guy, Mickey Barnett, who was the state Republican Party, the state delegate to the National Republican uh, Party. And all three of them, right? And John Dendall was more or less of a Neanderthal on a lot of policy issues, but they all agreed that the drug war made no sense and that legalization was more or less the right answer. And so I made it a priority to get out to New Mexico to meet Gary Johnson, befriended Gary Johnson, opened up an office, a branch office in New Mexico in January 2000. And we then started introducing bills in the state legislature. The Democrats hated Gary Johnson because he had vetoed more spending bills than all the other previous government governors in the history of New Mexico. But the Democrats were sympathetic to moderate drug reform. Forum. Gary Johnson was, you know, some of the legalization. I persuaded Gary to say, stop talking about legalizing all drugs, talk about legalizing marijuana and a harm reduction approach with the other drugs. He bought into this. And I'll tell you something. Even though this guy was, a, you know, you know, veto any spending bill by the end in the last year of his term. He signed off on a bill that increased drug drug treatment spending by the state by 50 percent. And I think he did it because he had been humanized on this issue and because I think he understood that spending the money on drug treatment would actually result in a net cost savings for taxpayers because it would reduce criminal justice costs. So there were ways of communicating across that. You know, the hard time I always have with libertarians is that, you know, basically if people you know, get hurt or screw up, you know, the libertarian, you know, viewpoint can often be one of total indifference, like leave it to private, you know, nonprofits to help people, you know, they didn't really, they don't really believe, um, they don't, they don't, they don't believe all that strongly in government helping out people who land up being misfortunate or screwing up. And that, that's the kind of non-compassionate side of right-wing libertarianism that's fundamentally problematic. And, you know, to the extent we have good evidence that things like increased taxation and time and place restrictions do do things like, you know, reduce cigarette consumption among young people and others do reduce alcohol problems. You know, the libertarian indifference to that kind of stuff, at least in the early years, I think was problematic as well. So those were the, the real divides on that sort of stuff. I had some similar successes talking to like some of these younger folks, uh -huh. and I, and certainly not 50 million, but like. That's that's substantial, and what a coup! And I, I think my th my talk track was this is a transitional thing. It's not where we want to land forever, and the spend will over time decrease because we're digging ourselves out of a multi billion dollar, multi decade drug war. And what's the, you know, we have to, right. you know, we have to spend and do some repairing. Exactly. No, um, I think that that's right. That's right. I mean, look, the argument I also use with libertarians, like my view of government is that government's role should be to, you know, uh, I mean, part of it is obviously to take care of people who are, you know, have bad luck, misfortune, what have you. Um, and, you know, things, that's why things like Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, you know, make sense. But beyond that, it's to think about taxpayer money as something as investing in the future, the same way a business invests in the future. It's why I was so admiring of what Biden and Schumer and Pelosi pulled off a uh, last year, where they got that major infrastructure bill through, you know, the stuff around, you know, building out America's infrastructure, building out the uh, internet, I mean, you know, building out in terms of environmental protection. These are all things which cost a lot of money now, but are going to result in huge benefits. Then there's their smart investments in the same way that you would want a family or a business to be investing in the future. Invest now in things that we're going to pay off for in terms of both dollars and human lives and well-being in the future. And that's my, you know, and I think a lot of stuff that 
that the left supports and that some of the right wing might ultimately, I mean, not today's right wing, which is so bonehead on in Neil, I mean, just horrible. Um, but when I'm thinking about Republicans who are more business oriented or cut tax, that frame about thinking about taxpayer money as investing in the future um, in a really pragmatic way, I think is, a, is, is possibly a significant area of common ground. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, so when I saw you on stage, I think most recently, it was um, the Trailblazers event uh, in New York, and you gave this super duper rapid fire uh, talk, um, largely around vapes. But could you could you kind of expand on that a little bit for my audience? Like, I don't, I don't know that they've been exposed to this line of thinking yet. Yeah, no, sure. Although it's interesting you say that, say that, Joe, because, you know, different people remember different elements of that talk, right? <laughs> and it's a talk I've been, I've been refining um, for different audiences. I've been mostly speaking at psychedelics audiences, cannabis audiences, uh, nicotine vaping uh, audiences, and then some co conferences on recovery and treatment and such. And, and part of what I've been talking about is um, I talk, what are the issues? You know, I, I make the analogy to talking, giving a talk in Baltimore 20 years ago where I asked a group of emerging leaders in business, government, civil society, what, you know, how many of them supported needle exchange programs to reduce the spread of AIDS? And overwhelmingly, they raised their hand. And then I asked the question, well, how many of you who are old enough supported needle exchange programs to reduce AIDS when the very brave mayor of Baltimore, Kurt Schmoke, in the late 80s, early 90s, first proposed this? And a lot of hands go down. And I make the point, well, you know, there's a cost to a slow learning curve. Right. There's a cost because in the time it took you and many other people to understand that needle exchange programs were the right thing to reduce HIV AIDS and other diseases. A lot of people died because we were not doing right away what many European countries just instantly did because it just made sense, both from a science perspective and a common sense perspective. So then I jump forward. And I say, OK, now it's 2023. Where do we where do we think we're all we all we think we're all enlightened. Here we are, at, you know, a cannabis conference, psychedelics conference. Uh, you know, we're, we're all enlightened. But where, in fact are we maybe not as enlightened as we think? Where are we being backward and patting ourselves on the back when in fact the issues that are just as clear as needle exchange was back 30 years ago are in fact manifesting? And I talk about four issues. One of them, depending upon the audience, is the psychedelic renaissance, which you know we all see it and your audience sees it. You know We see it everywhere. But if you're not in this world, you're oftentimes are very slow to embrace it. You're not following the news. You're seeing a couple of headlines. You're not paying attention, whether you're in the recovery world or a range of others. So I say, you know, one area is let's understand that this psychedelic renaissance, it really is revolutionary. And it is going to transform, you know, mental health and psychiatry. And it's going to do a lot of other things and, you know, get on board. The second issue I say is we have a massive overdose crisis, you know, which is basically about this drug fentanyl, not fentanyl that's being prescribed in hospitals, but fentanyl that's being produced illicitly in China and Mexico shipped here. And it's a problem of an unregulated drug supply with a drug which is very hard, you know, it's deadly in infinitesimal amounts. And therefore, we have to get bold quickly in order to tackle this issue. And getting bold means thinking about what the Canadians call safe supply, about allowing people who are determined to get their drugs, whether they're legal or illegal, who are willing to go to the street, take the risk of overdose, allow those people to get the drugs they want, including even fentanyl or heroin, from legitimate supplies. Maybe government sanctioned you know, outlets. Maybe they pay a few bucks. Maybe they get it for free. But go bold in our thinking about that. The third issue I talk about is we all know about the horrors of Purdue Pharma and the, you know all the evil pharmaceutical companies you know grossly promoting their pharmaceutical opioids OxyContin you know back in the late 90s early 2000s right um, and you know that stuff has been seriously cracked down on now we demonize the players involved um, but you know what's happened is that the pendulum has swung so far in one direction that we're not dealing with the opposite problem, which is the underprescribing of opioids to people who really do need them. And that no amount of psychedelics, you know, innovation or cannabis, both of which can help with issues around pain that opioids deal with. But ultimately, opioids have been around for tens, thousands, if not tens of thousands of years for relieving pain. And that now you have people going to the black market, committing suicide, all these sorts of things, right? Because they 
they because doctors are stripping people of their pain medications, even though those pain medications are working for them. And then the fourth one is the issue that you, that you know you raised just now, which is the issue around nicotine vaping. And the point I make right is that if I could snap snap my fingers. And all of the 30, 35 million American cigarette smokers in the country today, or all of the 1.1 billion you know, sm smokers around the world, were to suddenly stop smoking cigarettes, and all of them were to take up vaping, you know, the e-cigarettes, or else these heat not burn devices, ones called ICOs, right, which are kind of like the PAX version of, you know, marijuana, heating the, you know, the tobacco up to a point short of burning, or these nicotine pouches that are now being used, uh, you know, SNUS or Zin or On, that if you could snap your fingers and all of the smokers were to stop smoking and switch to those things, it would represent one of the greatest advances in public health in U.S. and global history, because the risks of smoking are so dramatically, dramatically greater than the risks of consuming nicotine in non-combustible forms. And then I make the point that this huge public health, like revolutionary advance in public health from switching to vaping and, and these oral things would be true even if hundreds of millions of adolescents took up vaping. We don't want adolescents taking up vaping, right? Unless it was to stop smoking, right? But basically that the risk to young people, so far as we can tell from all the evidence, all the biomarkers, all the independent commissions and studies, you know, the risk to young people, you don't want them doing it, but the risk to their health is really modest compared to a lot of other risks that adolescents confront out there from everything from cell phones to alcohol to pharmaceuticals to whatever, and that the benefits to adults of quitting smoking are that great. And as I point out that, you know, in America now, 60 to 70 percent of Americans believe that vaping nicotine is as or more dangerous than cigarettes. Right. 60 to 70 percent of all Americans believe that that nicotine, the drug nicotine causes cancer when well, nicotine doesn't cause cancer. What causes cancer is the inhaling combustible tobacco, you know, with all the burnt particle matter. I don't know if people remember three, four years ago when all of a sudden people end up in a hospital with this stuff splattered on their lungs and people were dying from vaping. It turned out that was all about tainted THC cartridges where some knuckleheads had been using vitamin E acetate, you know, that was safe to drink. But, you know, Deadly, deadly or dangerous to, to heat. So I make the point, and this is, of course, the, the one like it's stuck in your mind from my talk. For many other people, too, they just they don't know this stuff. It's so opposite what people normally think. And because big tobacco is increasingly the major provider of vaping devices, nicotine vaping, and they're so rightfully demonized for their historical evils with promoting smoking, and which is really frustrating for me, who's the leading anti-vapers oftentimes is coming from the left politically. The same liberal Democratic politicians who were my allies on legalizing marijuana first medically and more broadly, on needle exchange, on safe injection sites, on you know treatment instead of incarceration, they're the same ones leading the charge to ban vaping and flavored vaping, which is totally the opposite of what the science says should be the right policy. Mm. And we need more people willing to stand up and talk about the science. And I, I love that I boiled your whole thing down to vapes. It's fascinating. Because <laughs> yeah, I, think I, I think that's the one that do. blew my mind. Yeah. I think I was with you on the other three already. But I'm like, holy shit, this vape thing. I've been thinking this. I just haven't thought it through yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, exactly. So, so, and, But other people, if they know about the vaping thing, for them, it's, holy shit, we have a problem with the underscribing of opioids now? You mean, don't we, aren't we still dealing with that problem for 15 years ago? Uh, no, sorry. Different problem emerging now. You know, we just got, you know, or, yeah. So it is true. But, you know, I, I really, I try at every single conference. Like when I spoke at that amazing MAPS conference in Denver a few weeks ago that everybody was at with almost 12,000 people there, and I gave a policy talk at the end, and I started off talking with a kind of more nuanced approach towards how we should think about psychedelic exceptionalism. But from there, I went into this riff about the, you know, the, the, the slow learning curve and, you know, or I'll talk, literally I do psychologist conferences. I get, I talked to some drug policy group, you know, online in Finland. I helped the folks in Latvia organize their first Baltic, you know, psychologist conference. But in every one of these conferences, you know, I'm talking about, or a cannabis conference is it's people need to understand this stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one final point on the opioid thing before we jump to the next one, I, 
from what I understand, even um, hospice patients are having a hard time accessing meds, um, opioids specifically. And it's, um, I think there could be something going on in relation to, um, who is it? that Does the DEA set drug production quotas for different sectors? You know, I mean, the DEA has played various problematic roles in this. And sometimes they, they have actually, yes, limited the amount of opioids that could be prescribed. I don't know if that's the major issue now. I think what's really happened, in fact, is there was such an overreaction that doctors are now afraid to prescribe. Um, they begin to believe, you know, people used to believe that prescribing opioids for pain was highly addictive. Then people dismiss the worries about it. And now we've gone back to, once again, overhyping the concerns about it. In fact, when you're being prescribed opioids for pain, if it's being properly managed by a doctor, the risks of really getting addicted in a way that's problematic for long are, are pretty low, right? Um, but you have medical review boards in every state that are you know, discouraging doctors. You have doctors who are afraid of taking on patients, you know, and then there's these uh, they're afraid the DEA or state enforcers might be looking over their shoulder. So there's a whole network of disincentives. Um, uh, and some of the pioneers in trying to deal effectively with the undertreatment of pain have now been demonized because the few mistakes they made in sort of, you know, minimizing some of the risks of opioids at one point. Now, notwithstanding the huge amount of good work they've done, you know, people see that really pioneers who want to do the right thing, you know, can be demonized in this new world. So. Mm. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I th that's that's obviously the big one. It's like political, cultural. But I I, I would love to dig into the uh, DEA problem. Somebody, if you're an expert in that, reach out. <laughs> love to dig in. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, yeah. I'm not sure what the latest. I mean, I will say one other thing, which was that you know back in the late '90s, early 2000s, when Purdue Pharma and, and the uh, you know it's funny we blame Purdue Pharma. Um, but in a way, Purdue Pharma became to the opioid problem kind of what Xerox is to copying machines and Kleenex is to tissues. You know, Purdue Pharma was just one. I mean, you had Johnson & Johnson, you had the major drug distributors. So it was a huge industry-wide problem. And Purdue Pharma, because they were the ones who created OxyContin, but it was a much, 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 much big, bigger problem than that. But, you know, even during those years when they were doing this gross promotion, they were nonetheless sending in their regular required reports to the DEA about, you know, where they were shipping, where everything was going on. And the DEA wasn't even paying attention. They were ignoring this stuff. So they really dropped the ball in a serious way at that time, from what I understand. Um, so and then in terms of, uh, you know, what role they're playing now, I don't know. There's a wonderful organization um, called NPAC, National Pain, Pain Advocates center, I think. Um, if you just type in NPAC, N-P-A-C, you know, pain, it'll pop up, headed by a woman named Kate Nicholson. I'm on their advisory board, but they're really fighting the good fight to try to deal with this issue that, you know, there are many people with acute pain who still need opioids and that can be managed. And that even though opioids is not the recommended treatment for chronic pain, there are nonetheless millions of people who have been are handling their chronic pain with opioids successfully and, and stripping them from their prescription when they've been leading their lives successfully and managing their pain is really gross malpractice, even though it's now seen as something that medical boards think they have to do. I mean, it, it's one of the ways in which the public hysteria and ignorance, you know, is at odds with what the actual science is. Right. So here's a technical one, maybe. Um... <laughs> And let's see what we got. So we, we chatted in Denver a little bit about, um, I kind of doubt the utility of decrim, but you kind of straightened me out a little bit there because I, I want this safe supply model as soon as possible across all categories of drug. Um, but you know, you, you helped me understand that decriminalization is still quite valuable in that people can operate in a more safe way as opposed to being exposed to more risks. But could you could you kind of lay out the why decrim model for us and then sure. and then maybe like then let's transition into like why safe supply is also crucial. Yeah, I mean I think first of all decrim and when we talk about, you know, people define, people normally find legalization as something akin to the way we treat alcohol and tobacco and now increasingly marijuana, which means that not just it's not just that people are allowed to possess a small amount for their own use, but that it actually can be legally produced, legally marketed, legally sold in licensed tax paying stores, right? That's the typical understood definition of legalization. 
decrim essentially refers to the production, the sale, uh, still remaining illegal, but that people are not being penalized. They're not losing their freedom or getting much more than a fine for possessing small amounts for their own use, or if it's a drug you can produce at home for making a small amount for their own use. So that's decrim. So then the question is, why decrim? Well, the first one is, is that in a world in which changing the laws to make something legally available right through licensed outlets is just not politically possible, decrim is very much an incremental step. And that progress towards decrim does not retard the movement towards broader legalization. If anything, it oftentimes helps to advance it. It's not like, you know, some people say, oh, well, uh, don't, don't support decrim. You're going to eliminate the possibilities for much far-reaching reform. And my view is that nine times out of 10, you know, in most countries and most places in the world, incrementalism is the name of the game when it comes to real policy reform and advocacy. And that if you do incremental reform, always keeping your eye on the long-term objective, and thinking about it like chess, where if you have to settle for a quarter or a third or a tenth of the loaf now, you're at least positioning yourself with allies and even some opponents to take the next step down the road, right? Incremental is the name of the game. The second thing is that decrim, in fact, I mean, you know, uh, you know, when you decriminalize something, sometimes that means the police stop arresting people, right? Now, I, I mean, it was an interesting case in this thing. You know, back in the 1970s, 11 states decriminalized the possession of marijuana, including California and New York. And one result was that marijuana arrests dropped dramatically in both states for a long period of time. Then what happened is by the time you get into the 2000s, there are more people being arrested for marijuana in California and New York than were being arrested before they decriminalized. And the reason being that you have police officials and mayors and others, you know, who start saying, look, you can still arrest people for smoking in public. You can still arrest them for having it in their pocket if you get them to take it out of their pocket. You can still, they begin to engage in subterfuges to violate the spirit of the original decrim law, right? That's why in the case of marijuana, ultimately you needed legalization because, you know, the cops just showed if given the opportunity, they would just keep finding ways to arrest people, right? But decrim for an extended period of time can be a model, so, you know, can be a very effective way of reducing the harms of the drug war. Right. Thirdly, to the extent you reduce the penalties for possession, it means that people, even people who are, you know, injecting heroin, cocaine, you know, drugs like that, they're given more of an opportunity to take care of themselves. Right. If you if you've decriminalized small amounts of an illicit drug as well as the paraphernalia, it means people don't need to hide in the same way and do things in the dark. It means that if something happens, they don't, they're more likely to call 911. It means that they can take better care of their health, right? So that's another element of decrim. And then, you know, the other thing, of course, is that sometimes when governments get involved, you know, they can really fuck things up. I mean, a lot of us worry, like, if now that Biden has announced that they want, they're going to look at to rescheduling marijuana from Schedule 1 to something else, and some people say, well, let's just deschedule it, make it legal, get the federal government out of the way. And there's a lot of arguments for doing that. On the other hand, there's a fear that once you do that, you know, the big alcohol, big tobacco and big consumer goods will rapidly take over the entire cannabis business, which lots of us would prefer not to see. Right. But the second thing about this is that people say, well, maybe if they just change it to schedule three. Right. That way, you know, we resolve a lot of the problems of being in schedule one in terms of, you know, issues around banking and, and taxes and, and medical research and all this stuff. But when it's in schedule three, that invites the FDA to get involved. And then it begins to raise the issue. You know, we all want the FDA or most of us want the FDA to be involved in one element of the MDMA thing and be approving these drugs. But in the marijuana one, where cannabis is already legalized for more or less half the country in like over 20 states and over half the population, the notion of inviting the FDA in when you already have state regulatory boards doing a pretty good job of regulating cannabis, you know, I mean, I look at what the FDA has done in other areas, most notably in the, in the nicotine vaping area where they've been a nightmare, a disaster, highly politicized, highly ineffective. Um, you know, uh, I say, you know, maybe decrim is better than having that type of, you know, overweening government regulation happening. Um, and then I think the last point, Joe, although I could probably come up with some more, but the last point for now is, is that, 
if you look at the initiatives in Oregon and Colorado, and you see they're operating on two tracks, right? One is about allowing licensed professionals to, you know, administer MDMA or in the future, you know, MDMA and then psilocybin for various conditions or even just for general health, right? But then there's this other part about decriminalization. So that people can grow their own mushrooms, can obtain, you know, grow their own San Pedro, whatever it might be, can have their groups, can have their sessions, and that all this can be tolerated to exist outside the regulated environment. And a lot of these are people in groups who don't want to be regulated by the state. If you have some kind of, you know, shaman or, or, you know, ayahuasca group leader or traditional leader, you know, they don't want to be licensed by the state. Um, you know, they're wary of that and, and they want to be able to get this stuff, you know, in an informal way. And so when the state compromises, as they did in the Colorado law and say, look, don't get too out there. Don't get too public. Don't get too big. We don't want to see anybody making real money on this stuff. That's a compromise with the kind of individual and communal desire to have this stuff decriminalized, but not legally regulated. It also, though, I should say, you know, I had a fascinating conversation with one of the folks from the organization ICERS, um, Hieronimo, who gave a great talk in, uh, at the Denver conference. And he's talking about the work that ICERS is doing with, you know, both indigenous leaders and others around the world, especially outside their own country of origin, in trying to create informal standards that may not be government mandated, but trying to do the things that government regulation would seek to do in terms of reducing exploitation and the harms that can result from use of psychedelics, but to do it in a way that's being done without the government either being involved at all or being involved in a heavy handed way. And so decrim, you know, really does serve, you know, a lot of purposes. Um, it may not be effective over the very long term, but it is a very good, you know, approach in the short term. Right. It certainly improves their situation. Like, um, people can, yeah, experience less harm, operate more safely. You know, in, in Colorado, I, you probably saw this, like um, dance safe style test kits um, were still considered paraphernalia. You could get in big trouble for possessing under certain arrest conditions. Oh. And that recently changed. But Yeah, but you have Republican states that are actually passing laws to ban such, you know, you know, types of uh, harm reduction kits. I mean, you just think, what the hell is going on with these people? You know, but like, so you know, it's, an, it's the old anti harm reduction argument. Mm -hmm. it, it's the way people say we don't want to allow clean needles because more people inject drugs. Well, it turns out there's very little evidence to support that argument that making sterile needles more readily available through needle exchange programs and pharmacies. There's very little evidence indicating that leads more people to inject drugs. But even if there was evidence, you would still accept that because having a slightly smaller, a slightly greater number doing this activity, but dramatically healthier. Right. People used to worry that if you if you uh, encourage if you start put, mandating seatbelt laws, that people will drive faster. Well, there may be a little bit of truth to that. But quite frankly, the net benefit is overwhelming. You know, I mean, there was a point on um, uh, during World War One when uh, uh, the U.S. military was international or even and there was a question about whether or not soldiers should be provided with condoms when they were out on shore leave. And the answer was, well, one side said, well, you're going to encourage them to go to sex workers and all this sort of stuff. And the other side said, well, you know, they're still going to go to sex workers, but it's a real, it's a national security issue if we got large numbers of our troops coming down with sexually transmitted disease, right? So it, there's always been this kind of moralistic, stupid opposition to harm reduction. Um, and it turns out, you know, uh, sex education schools, another one. Oh, sex education schools, more kids are going to be screwing one another, you know, before they're of the age where they should be screwing one another. And, and you know, even if there is a little bit of truth to that and there wasn't a lot, the net benefit in terms of, you know, health and well-being is so substantial. Um, so, but, you know, we're never going to get rid of that moralistic, you know, knee-jerk opposition to pragmatic harm reduction policies and interventions. <laughs> I guess the the hope is like David Nutt tried and and many others are trying like how do we develop a drug policy based on science and hopefully a little bit of compassion sprinkled in 
Well, I mean, look, the fact of the matter is that Europe, you know, really moved forward. I mean, if you look at the Netherlands, first by pioneering a, a kind of decriminalized uh, cannabis policy, you know, being in late 70s, early 80s in the coffee shop system. You look then at Switzerland leading the way on prescribing pharmaceutical heroin to people addicted to street heroin who were not, could not quit with methadone or other means, and also the safe injection sites, which sprung up all around Europe and then Canada, Australia. Um, you know, leading these were all science. I mean, they were they were they were pragmatic. They were common sense, and they were backed by science. Right? You look what we did with medical marijuana in the United States, where the United States became the pioneer of global cannabis reform. I, I think. I mean, I think you know, if I look at what if I, what's my most historic contribution in terms of my decades of advocacy, it was probably in leading the way on the legalization of medical marijuana in the U.S. between 1996 and early 2000s in a way that helped open up towards broader decriminalization and legalization. And that if you ask how and why was it that the United States, which was for so long a period of time the epicenter and global proselytizer of a punitive prohibitionist drug policy, nonetheless and paradoxically became the global leader on cannabis reform, first with medical and then more broadly, I think it almost certainly boils down to the fact that the strategy we pursued around the legalization of medical marijuana beginning in the mid-90s was the thing that transformed public dialogue and opened this thing up. Right. But ultimately, we were about grounding things in science as well as basic human rights and compassion. And we've seen in the U.S. with the advances on cannabis and psychedelics, with the rejection of some of the harsher drug war policies, you know, um, uh, you know, we do see that, you know, the medical, the scientific side slowly inches forward and sometimes can grab and retain turf, you know, when the evidence becomes overwhelming or when the right political leadership is in place. Mm hmm. And um, maybe as we start to wrap this up, I'm kind of curious about what is is there a path forward towards some sort of safe supply here in, domestically in the U.S.? Like we see some good options in, in Switzerland. I, Portugal maybe is working on it, but. Well, Portugal, um, the, I left out Portugal. Portugal's great innovation was to adopt a policy a little over 20 years ago where they had a major problem with street crime and HIV among their drug users. And they basically adopted a policy that was not even the legalization of, of simple possession. They basically said, we're making a serious commitment to put nobody behind bars for simple drug possession. We're going to encourage them to get helping services, encourage them to get treatment. But if they don't do what we ask, we're not going to put them in jail. We're not going to drug test them. If they go out and steal or hurt somebody, we will punish them. And if they're selling drugs on the streets, we will punish them. But their basic you know, thing was we're not going to be putting people in jail anymore for simple drug possession. We're going to try to help them and we're going to spend the money on helping rather than punishing. Right. That was the Portuguese innovation. When it comes, you know, it's really British Columbia and Vancouver, which have pioneered on safe supply. Even there, they've done it in a very modest way, basically because of political limitations. I mean, you essentially want to be, you know, going out to a population that's, you know, using fentanyl and drugs like that and basically saying, look, we want to help you. Here's an offer, some housing treatment, blah, 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 blah. But quite frankly, you know, we'd rather you just here. You want fentanyl? Here. You got it. You know, I'm going to give it to you. You know, you know, you're going to kill yourself with it. We don't want you to kill yourself with it. But at least you know that this is 0.01 grams. You know the dose. I'm going to tell you that if you mix it with this, it's going to make it more dangerous. You know, I mean, that basic model and the, the $64,000 question in the whole drug policy legalization debate is how do we open up a system of safe supply? So that the people who are determined to get these drugs, no matter if it's legal or illegal, can get what they want from a civilly liable, regulated source. How do we do that in a way that does not present a broader public health threat to the broader society? Right. You don't want to go from a system like that to the crass mass marketing of these drugs in the way that you see the pharmaceutical companies marketing a whole range of their of their pharmaceutical drugs. And it's finding that balance of allowing the people who really want it to get it safely and legally without opening up it to the broader society in ways that could you know, resent, result in a lot of, har a lot of harms. I, I do wonder, Joe, whether some of the thinking 
going on now, especially in the psychedelics world, even more than in the marijuana world, because marijuana, you know, has really moved much more towards a kind of alcohol based retail model, slightly more regulated. But if we look in the psychedelics world where people are trying to come up with innovative ways to allow access to these substances on, um, you know, with some levels of oversight, some levels of commitment, training, licensing, some decriminalization, but requiring certain safeguards. I wonder whether or not there are variations of that model that can be used as models for how to deal with the opioid crisis today. Mm -hmm. I would love that. And I yeah. think there's something there, right? Like, you know, sit through 20 minutes of training, and get your naloxone and yeah. see you later. And that's a lot cheaper of a model than responding to deaths and yeah. everything else. It's really horrible um, what we're dealing with now. You know, there was one model I was kind of puts out there as a kind of thought experiment. But imagine if any time you wanted to get a drug, um, any drug, um, whether a doctor had recommended it or prescribed it or not, you could go to the pharmacy. And before the pharmacist was allowed to hand you the drug, the screen would pop up with the name of the drug and the concentration. And you'd have to answer, the, the, the purchaser would have to answer 10 questions correctly, right, before the pharmacist could legally hand over the drug. So the consumer could take the test as many times as they want until they got it right, right? And at some point, if you're going back over and over the same drug, you just bing, 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 you know, the answer is right away. But it would be a way of kind of compelling consumers to learn basic things about the safety and risks, safety margins and risks of the thing they're about to consume, right? So just to have that accurate information where, you know, you're force feeding that to people. You're not, you're saying you have a legal right as an adult to purchase this or purchase anything or almost anything you want, but you need to pass this test. And the test could be in every language. It could be read if you're blind, I mean, you know, whatever, whatever it could be. But that sort of thing, once again, you know, there was a wonderful book that came out 15 odd years ago called Nudge. I don't know if you ever saw it, Nudge, um, uh, by, uh, uh, I'm spacing on their names right now, but one of them I think was Thaler, uh, uh, who won the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics recently, uh, Sunstein and Thaler, Cass Sunstein. Sunstein and Thaler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sunstein and Thaler. And it's a brilliant book, never talks about drugs or drug policy. But and it, they call it a kind of, I think, is it a libertarian paternalism or a paternalistic libertarianism? I can't remember which one it was. But it was the idea about rather than forcing people to do something, how do you incentivize people to act in their own best interests? Right. And they just come up with all sorts of examples of this sort of stuff. And I think as we move towards various types of drug legalization regulation, how do we incentivize people to act in more responsible ways with respect to this freedom to obtain these substances? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, it's an interesting problem to yeah. have to solve. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, so Rick Doblin has been, um, revitalizing this kind of Tim Leary pilot's license model. Do you have any uh -huh. kind of uh, critiques or commentary on that? Uh, Remind model? you, what is the pilot's license? So it, it's similar to this, but you, you, you have to go somewhere, get some training, and then you can access supply in some way. Um, yeah, and it's I mean, not dissimilar from your pharma pharmacy model. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think those ideas are basically along the right way of thinking. The question about who makes the test Right. Like, you know, who who has the power to license? Is it a government given license or is it professional associations or guild or things like that? Next question is, what happens to people who go ahead and proceed with the activity but never get the license? Like, how do you enforce? You know, it's like it's like the question if you <coughs> excuse me, you get a driver's license. Right. But then what happens to people who are driving without a license? I mean, at some level, you have punishment kick in. So but I think that basic model, both with consumers and with the guides, um, uh, as I said, it's once again, that that, that model that I sears, you know, the uh, you know, the leading, you know, probably a lot of your listeners know who ICERS is, right? The kind of global organization organized the, the World Ayahuasca Congress, also working on issues around Ibogaine, but also really thinking hard about how to deal, you know, how to apply a harm reduction approach to the expansion of psychedelics being consumed and given in non-medical environments. Um, that type of responsible thinking, and not just thinking, but action and organizing is really pivotal. And then finding the right sorts of governments, whether local or national, um, to basically begin to buy into some of this approach. It has to be part of the way forward, because the fact of the matter is, as psychedelics get more out there, 
um, there are going to be an ever growing number of, you know, really bad things happening. And we've been lucky. I mean, there's bad things happening right now, whether it's, you know, people, you know, dying, you know, because they did something stupid when they were tripping or whether it's because, um, you know, people having adverse medical reaction or people who had a pre, you know, uh, pre-existing mental condition landing up, you know, flipping out and not really coming back. Um, so they're, you know, we're lucky in the sense that the media has been focused on, on the very positive news. But at some point, the media is going to get tired of all the positive news and they're going to start doing a whole run on the negative stories. And all of a sudden, we're going, what happened? All of a sudden, the media seems to be looking for who just died in a psychedelics related incident. And you're going to be a whole huge flurry. And all the people waiting for the opportunity to oppose psychedelics are going to pop right back up. That stuff is inevitable. And so as we move forward on, on really the psychedelics renaissance, you know, it's always important you know, the best defense may be a good offense, but the best offense is also one where you're always attentive to playing defense as you proceed. Because the, the, the further you proceed, the more turf you have to defend and the more vulnerable you become. And there's some things that you can count on, like the media or politicians are going to be looking for the opportunity to jump all over this stuff and do the same old, you know, negative shit that they did before. And look, some of it will be by responsible politicians who want a responsible, balanced policy that acknowledges both people's individual freedoms to do these things and acknowledges the medical, psychological, and maybe even physical benefits of these things, but also is trying to minimize the harms. So, you know, we, we need to be thinking about that vigorously. I think MAPS is doing that to some good extent. I think that's where Rick's coming from, Rick Doblin with, you know, Timothy Leary's uh, uh, model. I think it's where ICERS is coming with their models. Um, you know, and these things are very much complementary. So uh, I think that needs to be not a secondary issue. <laughs> I heard a uh, there's a fellow named David Langer who was at the conference and he's a you know, brilliant British uh, investor. He's got a bunch of different investment funds, one on, um, I, I think one's on climate, one's on psychedelics and mental health, and one's on artificial on AI. But as he says, you know, you can't really stop AI, but he goes, when you're thinking about advancing with AI, which can offer so many wonderfully positive things in terms of human civilization, but if the reducing the risk part of AI, including the existential threat to human existence, is not accelerating even more quickly than the capacities of AI are, then we may be heading into a disastrous you know, uh, area, right? It's about understanding that minimizing the risks has to be moving forward at at least the same pace as the advances in terms of achieving the benefits. And and the benefits coming with those risks. That's a lot, but it's um, it's exciting though. But how do we? How do we do that? That's for somebody smarter than me to sort out. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> fortunately, more more and more smart people are going to think about this stuff. But it's uh, you know, I mean, obviously, Joe, with the podcast here, you're playing a role. You're getting good people on. You know, you know, brainstorming these issues, and mm -hmm. and and you can see. I mean the the number of smart people writing and thinking about these things. Uh, you know, if somebody had told me 10 or 15 years ago that Harvard, Yale, Columbia, NYU, Langone, Johns Hopkins, UCSF, UC Berkeley, you know, Baylor, Alabama, I mean, you know, University College London, a uh, place around the world, would all have funded psychedelics research centers, I would have thought, you know, what are they smoking? Um, but it's extraordinary. Really smart, interesting, innovative people thinking about this stuff now. And I don't think that's going to go away for a very long time. No, like there's a reason these things, uh, psilocybin MDMA have been granted breakthrough status by the FDA, love them or hate them, mm -hmm. right? It's, it is the, the case that all pre preliminary data says this is going to blow other treatments out of the water, or at least radically yeah. outperform. Them. I mean, hell, even as I'm a big advocate of, of vaping as a tobacco harm reduction policy, I'm also, you know, incredibly impressed by the preliminary evidence coming out of Hopkins in terms of the value of vaping and dealing with and helping smoking. I'm mean, not vaping, uh, psychedelic psilocybin and dealing with smoking cessation. Um, I'm really impressed by the research, you know, Gould Dolan at Hopkins and her stuff about, you know, opening up that early learning period and how this may help not just with uh, mental illnesses, but maybe even with certain types of physical illnesses ranging on everything from stuttering to strokes. Um, I mean, you know, this is, uh, you know, you look at you look at politically uh, what's happened. 
you know, both with veterans and professional athletes who are two of the great crossover populations in America, you know, spanning the political spectrum from conservative to liberal. And to have, you know, what Aaron Rodgers, you know, the famous quarterback, you know, when he gets up at that conference and he says, I don't think there's any way I would have won the most valuable player award twice in my late 30s if I hadn't been doing ayahuasca. And that I've heard from hundreds of other athletes in all professional sports who either are doing this now or want to be doing it to improve performance. And then you have Rick Perry, the Republican governor of Texas, standing up there and talking about he is a knuckle dragging Republican, met the veterans talking about psychedelics. And then he fell in love with yeah. Rick Doblin. And I mean, this is this is extraordinary that you're having that type of crossover um, with psychedelics. And it's, uh, you know, it's leading to some. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. And in some respects, you know, one hopes that this can almost be a model for dealing with other areas of, of science-based policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, it's an important development and we're getting there. And, um, yeah, I, I, just like AI, there's no way we're stopping this. You can't put this genie back in the bottle this time around. People are a little freaked out. I think, yeah, we're going to have some bumps in the road, as you suggest. Media is going to try to backlash us a little bit or yeah well get more clicks i guess through i don't know more spicy articles yep. than oh yet another person was well, cured yeah. or whatever it's also, i mean you think that the situation happened some months ago right where somebody was it they sued maps because what, had their kid died in 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 uh i can't remember what exactly happened but there was oh this music about, festival situation yeah, i think so right yeah and, you know, that was an interesting said, case you know let's we're, we're going to sue mass because they screwed up and we're doing it to raise attention but the result of a lawsuit like that especially when they win is that it actually makes it dramatically more difficult to do harm reduction in the future and so you, you look at people pursuing that type of legal course of action you know, where they claim it's about helping bring attention, but in fact, it's having exactly the opposite result. Um, you know, it's yes, it's important to fix these things, but the methods and ways you go about it are incredibly important, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just like the same thing when you had that case involving the, the, the therapist in the MAPS training program, you know, who, you know, did stuff that was sexually inappropriate, et cetera. And on the one hand, you definitely need people to bring attention to that, you know, and more credit to them for bringing attention to those, you know, abuses. And, and on the other hand, what, one has to have the basic realization that that happens in all areas of psychotherapy and stuff like that. You can't eliminate this stuff. It's human nature, it's humankind. You can minimize the incidence of it. You can bring attentions to the abuses, but make sure that what you're advocating is the fix is not landing up doing more harm than good. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right, Ethan. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, well, is there anything else that you think the psychedelic audience should be clued into? Well, I mean, the we first thing, here? of course, is people, you know, even though I'm not doing it right now, I did this podcast of my own, Psychoactive, and I did 80 episodes in 80 weeks from uh, mid-21 to early 23. And, and, you know, then I stopped doing it, um, uh, taking a break. But I have to tell you, Joe, being at the Psychedelics Conference in Denver a, a little while ago, the amazing amount of positive feedback I was getting about that from lots, lots of people I'd never met before, that was really inspiring for me. And so, I mean, you're a real pro at this podcast, you know, thing, and you know it can reach a bigger audience. And for me, you know, I think, as I've told you before, it first came about because the uh, the movie director, Darren Aronofsky, who I'd known and been a bit of an ally to Drug Policy Alliance, he asked me if I wanted to do a podcast about psychedelics. And my response was, no, I want to do one about all drugs. And so it really is about everything from psychedelics to opioids to, you know, drugs like cot and kava and, uh, you know, uh, 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 kratom and things like that, to alcohol, to smoking, to cannabis, to politics, to politicians, to history, to whatever. I love doing it. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping I'll be back with it again because, I, you know, I, I have a list of hundreds of people and issues I still want to do. Um, but it was a lot of work. And uh, I'm enjoying life a little too much these days. So, uh, but, but hopefully I will be back with that. It's a good winter hobby. Uh, yeah, I guess. This is great. I guess so. And also a plug. Listen, the next big Drug Policy Alliance conference is going to be in Phoenix this fall. So just go to drugpolicy.org and your listeners, I think there will be some stuff about psychedelics there. They're going to be holding it on um, a Native American uh, reservation that has a hotel casino there. Oh, you there. told me about this. And so yes. that, that will be a, for people who want to engage in the broader drug policy reform movement, that could be a really good place to go as well. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. And um, the fall in Phoenix can be perfect or only slightly hotter than New York. Well, it can't, uh, I, be, it I can't love... be as bad as it is right this week where they're breaking their records for most days in a row at 110 degrees or over. Sheesh. Oh, my God. Uh, I used to go to Phoenix a lot. Yeah, I got really uh, used to going from, like, the coldest place where I live currently to the hottest place, Phoenix. And it was it was something. <laughs> oh, God. And it's only getting worse. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, but then again, by the fall should be beautiful weather. So hopefully that all. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually going to look at coming. That sounds awesome. Um, all right. Sounds well, good, Ethan, Joe. thank you so much. And um, I hope in the future we might be able to do this again. There's some updates and. Yeah, yeah, it would be my pleasure. You know, I'm glad it took us a while to schedule this, um, but I'm glad that we all came together between your schedule and mine. And um, I look forward to doing it again and, uh, and more power to you on all this. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ethan. Until next time. 